Hello, and welcome to the Canadian Patient Safety Institute's six-part webinar series focused on knowledge translation and implementation science. I am your host, Gina D'Souza, here with my CPSI colleagues, Gina Peck, our technical host, and Tricia Schwartz, our web host. Our call today is the first of six in the series, and we are pleased to present an introduction to knowledge translation and implementation science. Our guest speakers, Drs. Jeremy Grimshaw and Justin Presso, will present for approximately 40 minutes, allowing us 15 minutes at the end for questions and conversation. Please write your questions and comments in the question and answer box or the chat box, and they will be compiled and provided to our speakers at the end of the call. If you run into IT difficulties, please connect with us in the chat or question and answer box, and we would be happy to assist. Before we start, I want to remind everyone that this series is best consumed as a suite. However, you're always welcome, even if you are attending only one or all six webinars in the series. If you miss a webinar and want to catch up, please note that all of the webinars will be taped and available on our website the week following their original recording. I'm pleased to announce our speakers for today's session, Drs. Jeremy Grimshaw and Justin Presto. Dr. Grimshaw, received a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery degree from the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. He trained as a family physician prior to undertaking a PhD in Health Services Research at the University of Aberdeen. He moved to Canada in 2002. His research focuses on the evaluation of interventions to disseminate and implement evidence-based practice. Jeremy is a senior scientist in the Clinical Epidemiology Program, Ottawa Health Research Institute, a full professor in the Department of Medicine, University of Ottawa, and a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Health Knowledge Transfer and Uptake. He's a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Dr. Presso is a scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, assistant professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health, and the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa, and the scientific lead for knowledge translation at the Ottawa Methods Centre. Dr. Presso's research program operates at the intersection between health psychology and implementation science, drawing upon behavior change theories and methods to understand factors that promote and undermine behavior change in healthcare settings. Dr. Presso has a PhD in psychology from the University of Aberdeen, has been awarded early career awards from the UK Society for Behavioral Medicine, the International Society of Behavioral Medicine, and the European Health Psychology Society, and is an associate editor for the journals Implementation Science and Applied Psychology, Health, and Wellbeing. Over to you, Jeremy and Justin. Thanks very much, Gina, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, on behalf of Jeremy and I, I just want to thank everyone for, for making the time for this first webinar, and, to, and we're really delighted to have this opportunity to, uh, to walk you through uh, for this first one anyway, uh, an introduction to knowledge translation and implementation science um, to, uh, to start to consider how principles from KT and implementation science might apply to your own patient safety initiatives. Oh, there we go. Um, so we'll, as a brief overview of what we hope to cover today, we'll um, skip over the uh, introductions which have been uh, covered for us, thanks very much, um, and I'll then provide a quick overview of what we're hoping to cover not only today but over the course of the next few months and the six um, webinars. I'll then pass it over to Jeremy who will cover the historical roots and rationale for KT and implementation science, 
and then using uh, a practical case study from um, a patient safety initiative locally, um, well, I'll, I'll cover, uh, I'll give you a brief overview of key approaches and frameworks that might be useful um, for implementing and evaluating patient safety initiatives. Skip that. Um, so we've heard about the two of us, but we, we wanted to just flag a bit more about what we do and where we're based. And so I think broadly speaking, we would characterize what we do as we're, we're interested in professional and organizational behavior change. To answer the question, how do we ensure that patients get the right evidence-based treatments when they need them most? And so as a consequence, we focus on a, a range of different populations of healthcare providers and stakeholders and patients and the organizations that they work within or they interact with. Um, and we're, we're embedded within a, a broader team at the Center for Implementation Research at the Ottawa Hospital, which um, really uniquely brings together a range of different disciplines to answer this question of how do we improve healthcare quality. So we've got um, folks from a, a, back, a range of different backgrounds, whether it be cognitive psychology, medical sociology, health services research, biostats, uh, nursing, shared decision making, health economics, medical education, through to human factors engineering, all bringing their perspectives um, in an interdisciplinary sort of way uh, to bear on this question of how do we improve care received by patients. Um, so that's, that's where we're coming from. Um, but um, the, the broader background, I suppose, to this webinar series and why you're all here and why, why we're here as well is um, we know that ensuring patient safety remains a high priority for healthcare systems around the world um, and the organizations and providers that work within them. And CPSI has been really at the forefront of efforts to promote patient safety um, in Canadian healthcare settings and really has achieved remarkable improvements in patient safety. That said, there are still substantial challenges to implement patient safety practices. Um, but as an example to address those, uh, Shift to Safety is a platform for C that CPSI is launching um, which is a new initiative to try to promote the use of behavioral approaches in patient safety initiatives. So why a behavioral perspective, you might be asking yourself, um, when we're talking about KT uh, and implementation science. We pose to you that when we're talking about successful implementation of a patient safety program, um, it needs the key actors in that process to change what they do, in other words, their behavior, and or the decisions that they make, whether we're talking about healthcare providers, patients, managers, or even as high as policymakers, in order for these programs to be implemented successfully, someone needs to change what they do, usually more than one person, usually more than one level, but nevertheless it involves changing what people do. And so our approach is to draw on the substantial evidence base in behavioral sciences to support the development of patient safety programs and hopefully increase the likelihood of their success. And so based on that, our plan for this webinar series is to try to build capacity in the basic principles and practice of knowledge translation and implementation science so that you can inform your own patient safety initiatives. And so we're gonna cover the background in terms of um, the, the underlying science, but also with a practical spin offering, hopefully offering tools that can be of use in your own patient safety uh, initiatives across Canada. Um, so this first webinar is really a, a scene setting webinar to introduce you to some key concepts in the background to implementation science and KT um, with a view to then building on that with, with each subsequent webinar. So webinar two, uh, Jeremy will lead uh, uh, the webinar focusing on the role of knowledge creation and synthesis. We'll then have a webinar focused on um, identifying ways and tools for identifying who needs to really do something differently in order to promote implementation. Um, we then thought we would emphasize um, with two webinars the role of how do we go about systematically identifying barriers and enablers. And so the webinar four will focus on introducing you to a specific framework and then webinar five will introduce you to tools and tips for how you might apply that framework in your own setting. And finally we'll wrap things up in June um, with a webinar on once we identify barriers and enablers, how do we go about selecting and evaluating strategies to address them uh, in a patient safety context, uh, setting? Um, 
We'll pass it over to Jeremy, who will take us through um, historical roots of KT and implementation sites. Okay, thanks a lot, Justin, and uh, uh, welcome to everyone on the call. As Justin said, we're delighted there's been so much interest, and uh, uh, we hope you'll find this is helpful for your, for your own thinking. Um, I, I, I'm going to kind of continue a little bit with, with further sort of background about why um, um, safety and quality are, are big issues and how implementation science and knowledge translation science may help. Uh, and this slide really highlights that this is not a, a new concern. Um, you know, if you look historically, there's been work uh, in diffusion of innovation stretching back into the, the 40s, but were first uh, brought together by Edward Rogers in 1962 when he published his classic book, Diffusion of Innovations, that largely looked to see across a range of sectors how do innovations move into uh, popular use uh, and what are the kind of processes you go through. Uh, there are other sort of key publications in the 1970s and 1980s. And in the 1990s, uh, we found the, uh, the development of evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice and policy, uh, particularly led from, uh, with, by, by colleagues at McMaster University. Um, but you know, I, I think you know, alongside evidence-based medicine, there's a, there's a growing recognition that just providing better knowledge, better guidelines, um, by itself is unlikely to lead to the improvements in quality and safety that uh, we wanted. And therefore, uh, um, um, it led to this much greater interest in, in implementation science and knowledge translation. Uh, and so knowledge translation and implementation science are really trying to say, how do we make sure that healthcare professionals and patients uh, and managers are using the best evidence to inform what they do in practice so that they provide the highest quality and the safest care that they can? Okay. We're uh, and this is kind of um, the, the key problem that we're trying to deal with. If you look at, in health research, one of the most consistent findings is the gap between what we know the research evidence says we should be doing and what we actually manage to achieve in practice. Uh, between 30 to 40 percent of patients uh, do not get treatments of proven effectiveness, so don't get treatments we know work. And between 20 to 25 percent of patients get care that's either not needed or even potentially harmful. And these findings are uh, truly global. They're from Canada, from the US, from Europe, from Australia, uh, in Africa, in Asia. Uh, and the fact that you can't find any healthcare system that's got this right, I think just demonstrates it's a difficult problem. If it was an easy problem, we wouldn't have to have this call. We'd have actually solved it, we'd have fixed it, and you know, care in our hospitals and our primary care practices would be uh, uh, of, of, of the highest quality and, and safe. Um, so the fact that there's nowhere in the world we can go to and say they've got it right, I think just highlights that the, uh, you know, the sort of implementation of, of research evidence and implementation of best practices is a fundamental challenge for healthcare systems to optimize care outcomes and costs. Uh, and we need to sort of see if we can uh, uh, potentially do uh, um, um, better. So what is implementation science? The two uh, uh, photographs in this are on the top. Professor Martin Eccles is now retired, but from the Newcastle, uh, University of uh, Newcastle in the UK. And um, um, Dr. Brian Mittman, from, uh, uh, originally from London, is now with Kaiser Permanente in um, the US. And they were the uh, um, founding uh, co-editors of the Journal of Implementation Science. And they define implementation science as a scientific study of methods to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. So the idea here is that um, actually what we do when we try and implement safer practices is a, is a human enterprise that we can actually study uh, and try and improve uh, uh, um, our approaches. So implementation science is an interdisciplinary um, scientific study of determinants, process, and outcomes of implementation in healthcare. And what we're trying to do is develop methods to promote the uptake of research evidence and best practices and safer practices in routine practice in clinical community and policy context. It's, um, yeah, there, uh, uh, the next slide will highlight that there are many different types of questions we need to address and many different sort of uh, methods we need to approach, both qualitative, mixed methods, and quantitative, and also that we need to involve a wide range of disciplines. There are many. Uh, uh, disciplines have got some important insights in terms of how do we improve safety and quality of care, uh, um, as judged by um, Justin's uh, 
a slide that showed uh, the skill mix we have in, in the Center for Implementation Research. Um, one of the areas of confusion, unfortunately, is that this field is known by many different terms around the world. Uh, so um, in, in the early 2000s, a colleague, Jacqueline Titro, uh, undertook a, a study that asked 33 different funding agencies in Australia, Canada, France, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, UK, and US, whether they had some, felt they had some responsibility for knowledge translation implementation, and if so, what they called it. And the 33 funders came up with uh, over 30 different terms uh, uh, um, that uh, they used to describe this area of activity. Uh, and you have those on the screen at the moment. And I, I think this is a real problem for the field, but I don't think it's something we'll fix. But I often find that people get fixated on um, a particular issue. Do you need to be able to get knowledge mobilization before you get knowledge transfer? And largely, I find this profusion of terms not very helpful. And I um, tend to sort of say, I'm very, I will take whatever is valuable from these different perspectives and use it if I think it'll help me improve the safety and quality of care we've got. In general, in the US, this, research, uh, this area of research is called dissemination and implementation research. In Canada, knowledge translation research. And in the UK, uh, implementation, implementation science. So um, I think one of the things that, uh, to say for the audience is you may uh, have heard different terms, uh, but what you should be thinking about is, does this help me do my job more smartly? Does it give me new ideas that might be helpful? And not get too hung up on the particular terminology used uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the field. So it's a relatively new field of health research. You can see it through going back to the 1970s, but really it's only in the last decade that it's, it's come to the fore. It's inherently interdisciplinary, and by that I mean a wide range of clinical uh, of disciplines need to be engaged. We need uh, individuals with clinical knowledge, with health services research, social sciences, design and engineering, informatics, methodologists, uh, and also sort of change, uh, um, change specialists. So um, when I'm being flippant, I would say if you have an ology in your disciplinary background, then you know, likely you have something that's useful to say in this field. Uh, and one of the key challenges is how do we bring together teams that will bring together, say, engineers with behavior change specialists, with um, health services researchers, so that we're, we're building the best science that we can. Um, these are just uh, uh, the types of, of things that get covered off in implementation science. I don't think you know, necessarily need to, to look at these in any great detail, but these are the kind of activities that we are uh, doing where what we're trying to do is develop some generalized principles and methods that will help people in their local healthcare organizations to be slightly more effective or, or hopefully much more effective in their safety and quality improvement activities. So we are kind of very interested in sort of basically uh, systematic reviews on our synthesis, and we'll talk about these in the next webinar about sort of basically what, both what care should be provided or should be avoided, and also what we know about trying to um, uh, uh, improve a, 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 a quality of care, um, looking at sort of particular barriers and facilitators to implementation and trying to understand those better so we can plan our safety and, pro and quality pro um, activities uh, better, um, thinking about sort of how do, we, how do we design interventions so they have an optimal effect as well as basically evaluating these. So there's a, there's, there's a very wide field going out there, but what we'd hope is that sort of basically we're trying to provide practical knowledge and tools that will help people in the field uh, to be more effective in their, in, their, in their quality and safety activities. So maybe just a few, a few slides to talk about what happens at the moment. So how do healthcare organizations currently try and implement change? And these slides are, these next few slides are slightly tongue in cheek, uh, but hopefully get the message across. Um, first of all, um, often what we get is that uh, basically people develop and disseminate clinical practice guidelines or clinical pathways, um, and these are very helpful tools for identifying you know, what we should be doing, uh, but often just if we just develop and disseminate guidelines by themselves, they'll not lead to optimal healthcare or safe healthcare. Um, 
the second thing is that often we have favorite solutions, and these often depend a little bit on what our background is. So if we are, if we come from an IT background, we'll often think that uh, you have more um, uh, more computers by the bedside and more sophisticated electronic health records will solve our, our quality problems. If we come from an epidemiology or research background, we might think that actually, you know, just providing better knowledge about what should be done and what should be avoided might lead to improving quality of care. If we're a manager, we might think about, well, how do we change the work processes? How can we change the flows in the, in the work environment so that people are more likely to practice safer and, and, and higher quality care? Uh, and if we're a, 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 a high-level policymaker, we may focus on particularly sort of levers that we can control like sort of the way we reimburse hospitals or healthcare professionals. So one of the problems is if we have these favorite solutions, we're often tempted to think that they will be a panacea. They will, uh, um, they, they will basically solve all of our problems. Uh, so if you have, a, the, the phrase is if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I think one of the key things you'll get out of this series of webinars is that we need to not just you know, focus on what our favorite uh, tools are, but we need to recognize we have a very broad um, um, toolkit, uh, and often the kind of key issue for us is how do we choose the right tool for the kind of problem that we're trying to deal with. Um, and one of the things I like about this slide is it gives me the opportunity to uh, have a Lee Valley catalog um, in a slide deck. So um, the next sort of um, uh, 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 approach that people often use, this is a phrase that's coined by our colleague, uh, Professor Martin Eccles. Uh, that the most frequently used model of change is the ISGRIA principle. In other words, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So what you often have are, are well-meaning um, senior figures in a healthcare organization uh, meeting to sort of basically try and um, develop uh, change proposals to, um, um, to, to, to sort of improve uh, safety or quality. Um, and what normally happens is that Whoever's talking longest or who is, uh, has the most gray hair or the least hair, their voice tends to dominate, and uh, uh, the group will come to some decision about what, um, what, what, uh, what they think should be done. But it's not clear that as, they, as they've come to those decisions, they've really thought about what the problem is in detail or um, um, yeah, that the kind of solution is a good fit to the problem, even if they identify it. So um, uh, uh, Martin suggested this was an expensive version of trial and error. Um, so in terms of the current situation, uh, if we look at those things that we've just talked about, all of these solutions work some of the time. Um, none of them work all of the time. It's unclear when they do work whether they uh, maximally improve practice, and it's unclear when they do work whether they represent the most efficient uh, use of scarce healthcare uh, resources. Um, and you know, this just further builds on some of the problems with the ISGLIA principle. It, it's inefficient. It isn't making best use of what we already know. So it can lead to reinventing the round wheel. So basically having to reinvent something we know should, you know, should work, which is wasteful of your resources. Um, but you know, often it also leads to basically reinventing square wheels where people actually develop interventions we know are unlikely to, to work uh, within a range of settings. Um, it, it may miss important factors. It may be that sort of basically, although we've got a good sense about uh, some of the factors that actually influence um, um, behavior that we'll have to sort of uh, uh, put into our change process, uh, we may miss important things. And it's not particularly based on, on, on the available science. It's very much based on our tacit knowledge, which is important, but um, I, you know, I think what we're arguing is that uh, uh, we, we could potentially do, um, uh, do, do, do better than this. So um, I would argue that despite uh, a lot of activity and resources in the field, many healthcare organizations have not achieved optimal care despite considerable investments. And that these are, the approaches they use are often more based on hunches or ISCRIA than on scientific evidence. And that we can probably do better. Another um, very senior colleague in the field, uh, Professor Richard Grohl, in 1997 suggested evidence-based practice should be complemented by evidence-based implementation. So in other words, we should be able to, we should be using science when we're thinking about our, our change processes as much as, we, uh, as, as much as we use science when thinking about what is the care we should be provided. And 
you know, Justin and I firmly believe that we actually owe it to the patients and the public we serve to do better and to sort of basically see if we can sort of elevate a lot of activities to, you know, we, to, to better use uh, available knowledge and science and to uh, improve the likelihood of their success. And I think with that, I'm going to hand back to Justin. Yes. Perfect. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so implementation science as a field recognize um, this issue of uh, the it seemed like a good idea at the time problem. And probably over the last decade or so has really um, recognized the potential value of, of theory and frameworks um, <coughs> to draw on what we already know and contribute to a sort of shared understanding or cumulative evidence base of what works for whom and why. Um, and as a field, it, it draws on um, not only a range of disciplines, but now, given that it's at least a decade old, is starting to develop um, more integrative and useful frameworks uh, in and of itself. Um, that being said, um, anyone who's dipped their toe into um, thinking about or, or trying to apply a theory, a framework, a model um, has probably come across the issue that there, there are tons and tons of different approaches. Um, and I find one really helpful paper um, published by Per Nilsson um, a few years ago now um, um, sort of categorized those different uh, approaches into three, I think, useful categories in a paper that um, with the great title, Making Sense of uh, Model Theories and Frameworks in Implementation Science. And what he was suggesting is that by and large, all these approaches can be categorized in three ways. There are um, broad approaches that provide us with a step-by-step -step in terms of the process that we might take to try to move evidence into practice. And these, these are process models. And I'll give you an example, two examples of that over the next two slides. Um, those are different from frameworks that might help us to understand what influences implementation. So what, what frameworks provide barriers and enablers, for example, and I'll, I'll provide an example of that, um, which are also different from um, frameworks that are designed to guide what you actually evaluate um, to see whether your implementation was successful. Um, and in order to walk us through each of these um, um, types of high-level frameworks, um, I thought it might be helpful to sort of contextualize that with a, um, a relatively common patient safety um, initiative uh, trying to improve physician hand hygiene. And so. I'll use some examples from some ongoing local work led by Dr. Kathy Su, who's our medical director of uh, um, infect infection prevention and control at the Ottawa Hospital, as well as uh, work by Jeremy and Janet Squires um, here locally as well. So this won't be new to anyone on the call. We know that healthcare-associated infections are one of the top 10 causes of um, hospital-related deaths worldwide, affecting at least 10% of patients in acute care hospitals. Um, we also know that hand hygiene, physician hand hygiene compliance remains an international issue uh, with compliance rates still hovering around sort of 50% um, and relatively poor understanding uh, or we don't really understand yet uh, in detail why compliance remains um, so poor. And so we'll use this example uh, for our, our sort of contextualizing case studies. We walk through the, these frameworks um, to um, uh, on the assumption that we're, what we're trying to do here is develop a patient safety initiative to improve physician hand hygiene. And then building on, on something Jeremy said, um, really the guiding principle for this webinar and, and the subsequent ones is um, I'm sure that of the 213 folks on the call and um, Jeremy and I and the Gina's and Trisha, we could all brainstorm potential um, solutions to this problem, some of which maybe, many of which may be successful. Um, but we don't know that for sure. Um, and we, our guiding principle is we need to really understand the problem in more detail so that the solutions that we um, develop and um, test are fit for purpose rather than developing elegant solutions for, for non-problems. Um, so, so going back to our, our three categories, we'll start by, um, if you were starting off this um, physician hand hygiene com um, compliance initiative, um, um, we might select an overarching process model to really guide the steps in developing that initiative. The two frameworks that I wanted to highlight, the first is what's called the Knowledge to Action Framework or the Knowledge to Action Process. Now, this is a, a sort of Canadian homegrown uh, framework developed and led by Ian Graham in Ottawa. Um, although my animation seemed to be gone, so you may not be able to see much of the framework, but I'll walk you through it. 
Um, the, um, the framework is described, is, categor is, um, um, is composed of, of two main components. There's this central component, which you can sort of see, which is, name, is the, uh, the knowledge creation funnel. Um, and around that circle, that, that, that central bit is um, the action cycle. And so in the middle part, um, if you could see behind that box, uh, the, uh, you would see that the knowledge creation funnel involves three steps. First, the high-level knowledge inquiry, and this is basically the range of different studies uh, and experiences and maybe audits locally and expert uh, knowledge on what do we know about um, uh, physician compliance with hand hygiene. Um, there's a range of evidence out there which needs to be distilled and synthesized, and that's the next part of the knowledge creation funnel, which is really to conduct scoping reviews or systematic reviews to distill it down to what do we actually know um, in a rigorous manner, which feeds into knowledge tools or products, of which, as Jeremy mentioned, are things like clinical practice guidelines. And prior to the, the sort of emergence of KT and implementation science, that was sort of the end of it. People would disseminate those products in hopes that would lead to change. Um, and, and we know that's not always the case. And so once those, th that, that evidence is distilled and products are produced, they need to be implemented. And so the outer rim of this model um, is a step-by-step -step process of how to go about that. And it suggests that we should start by identifying what the problem is in this case, physicians uh, washing their hands, uh, desanitizing their hands, sanitizing their hands, the, um, and it would suggest that once we identify that problem, select the knowledge from that funnel that we've just gone through that is most relevant to understanding that. It also recognizes the need to adapt that knowledge to the local context, for example, um, depending on how the setup is in a, little, in a particular setting, uh, how uh, hands might be um, sanitized. Um, it then suggests to assess barriers to knowledge use. Once those barriers are, uh, are identified, select uh, specific interventions, strategies that are best suited for those barriers uh, that were identified, and then evaluate whether that intervention is effective and sustained over time in that loop. And as you can see with the, the superimposed boxes here, we're going to use this model as a basis for informing the, the, the more specific webinars going forward, focusing on identifying the problem in webinar three, on how do we identify barriers and enablers in webinar four and five, and how do we select strategies and evaluate them in webinar six. Apologies again for this uh, superimposed um, lack of uh, transitions on the slide itself. The second process model that um, is a bit more, uh, in, in a way, um, user-friendly, immediately user-friendly, is what's uh, sort of been called the French model. Um, this is by, because it uh, is led by Simon French, a colleague of ours uh, at Queen's. Um, which organizes um, the step-by-step -step approach into basically answering four questions, starting with who needs to do what differently in order for something to be implemented. In other words, whose behavior needs to change and what are those behaviors and how do we know that? How, what is the evidence supporting that they need to change? So in this case, for physician hand hygiene, um, we're talking about um, sanitizing physicians' hands, we're talking about physicians, but we might be talking about patients as well, we might be talking about managers um, or other people. And what is the evidence behind that? Once we clarify that, we can then understand, try to understand what are the factors that determine whether or not each of those groups um, do or don't engage in this activity. Um, in other words, what are the barriers and enablers? And um, we'll see that rather than going at it completely um, inductively, um, we propose that using existing frameworks can help guide how we go about identifying what those barriers and enablers might be. And only once we get to that point, we then move on to, into a place of, given the barriers and enablers, what strategies are best suited to address those, rather than having a, a sort of a panacea um, approach that, um, of a strategy that might work in all settings, which we, we know may, is not the case. Um, and, so, and then finally, clarifying how do we actually measure whether there's change. And as I mentioned, we'll be focusing on this model and the previous one to sort of guide our steps um, over the coming webinars. So those are two examples of, of sort of step-by-step -step process models. They don't quite answer the question of how do we understand the barriers and enablers to change, and that's what this second group is, is really designed to do. Um, so as I say, uh, any, of, any of you on the call that may have um, attempted or, or maybe have the experience of, of using frameworks to guide their own initiatives um, will recognize that we aren't short of such frameworks. 
Um, but there, there seem to be a few predominant ones that are bubbling up to the surface, so to speak, uh, in terms of what people are finding useful um, in the field to un identify determinants of implementation uh, and barriers and enablers. First is a slightly older, fairly in Shortel, um, levels of change, which is really just to describe that change can occur at various levels, whether it's the individual, the team, the organization, or broader in the system, and there are individuals working throughout that. Um, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or CIFR, led by Laura Damschroeder in the States, um, which is a, quite a broad framework. I think there's 39 different constructs within it. Um, and then the Theoretical Domains Framework, um, which involves 14 different domains, and one in particular that we've been using quite a bit in, in our implementation research as well, and one that we'll be focusing on in particular in the coming webinars. Sometimes these are combined. For example, there's a recent review by Sarah Birkin uh, and colleagues that actually looked at which studies tried to combine CIFR and the TDF in uh, assessing barriers and enablers. Um, so on the left here is just the, 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 the list of different domains of inquiry from the theoretical domains framework. You don't need to read those in any level of detail. We'll cover those in a subsequent webinar. But just to flag, um, and, and consistent with our, our case study here, um, that we're um, that led by Janice Squires and, and Kathy, Sue and Jeremy, um, we've used this uh, framework as a basis for actually trying to design a physician hand hygiene compliance intervention. And I'll, I'll continue to walk you through that example as we go. So they conducted informant interviews with 42, key informant interviews of 42 different staff physicians and residents in medicine and surgery wards. They conducted focus groups with hand hygiene experts in each um, uh, in the institution. Um, and with senior management. They also observed hand hygiene practices and, uh, and conducted audits in inpatient medicine and surgery units. And in bold are the key domains that emerge from that. And I don't know if Jeremy has any examples. Sometimes the, the domain um, label may not immediately clarify what the, the, the barriers were. So um, what were the specific yeah. barriers? Well, a couple of things to, thanks Justin, a couple of things to say. First of all, we had uh, research funding for this. And so. Uh, we interview. We end up interviewing a lot of staff. Although, um, uh, as you'll learn uh, in subsequent webinars, actually, you probably you'll probably get most of the information you need within uh, 10 to 15 interviews. So it makes it a lot more flexible. Uh, and the theoretical domain framework gives you this kind of comprehensive uh, set of ideas that uh, um, psychology says is what drives our behaviour. So um, when we did this, for example, uh, um, knowledge uh, came up as a as a potential um, um, barrier and. This, I think, surprised uh, the, the people in the infection control team in the hospital. Um, but the knowledge barrier wasn't specifically that uh, physicians weren't aware they should wash their hands. They were aware of that. But at the same time, they weren't necessarily aware of the four moments for hand hygiene. So I think we're now up to five. But at the, the, the time, WHO suggested people needed to wash their hands before and after patient contact, um, before a sterile procedure, or if they are um, uh, exposed to, to bodily fluids. Um, and so what you had was a sort of sense in terms of people knew in general they should wash their hands, but they didn't know the very precise information needed. A second knowledge issue, for example, was um, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what is considered the patient environment. So the, the, uh, uh, the moments of hand hygiene are that you should uh, wash your hands before you um, um, yeah, uh, uh, engage the patient environment. Um, and we had some clinicians say, but if I don't test the patient, you know, surely I don't need to wash my hands, whereas they'd still be touching the sort of the, the records uh, uh, um, uh, um, by the bedside, the, the patient's covers, uh, the, 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 the table, other things. And so they, even though they weren't touching the patient, they still were um, at risk of exposure. So we identified some very specific sort of um, um, uh, 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 beliefs that, uh, uh, um, uh, or knowledge that, that people needed to know. Um, I think also people were surprised that skills came up, but actually, um, um, you know, one of the things that, that often, has, often happens in uh, professional training is that you expect that people know how to wash their hands thoroughly, um, and there's very little training. I, I, I left medical school many, many years ago, uh, but I don't think I was ever taught how to wash my hands, and so there may be specific, specific issues about, um, about skills. There are also issues around sort of basically just remembering to do this, particularly if you're busy or if you have actually have to go into a patient's room to see them urgently or you're going from patient room to patient room to patient room 
you may not remember to sort of wash your hands each time you, you move across the threshold. Uh, and finally, um, just as a few more examples, even though our hospital has got um, a, 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 a liquid gel uh, uh, or the alcohol gel um, um, dispensers, um, they weren't always sort of full. Uh, and so this is something in the environmental context that actually uh, 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 was a barrier to people washing or, or keeping their hands uh, uh, clean um, if when they went into a patient's room the, uh, the, 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 the gel was, uh, the gel bucket was not um, uh, was, was not uh, uh, clear. So hopefully you get a sense of there were kind of a range of different factors that we picked up on uh, that potentially could be addressed within our our intervention. I'm going to hand back to Justin. Thanks, Jeremy. And so. The idea here is that a framework, such as the theoretical domain framework, provides a systematic and, and hopefully comprehensive approach to try to interrogate what those factors might be um, in order to start to build up um, an intervention to address it. Um, and as a consequence of that, the team um, went into an intervention development process where they um, prioritized specific domains from the ones that they identified as important based on what was feasible and acceptable to the physicians in, in the settings in which the intervention was developed. And so they focused down on these five domains um, to address knowledge, skills, beliefs about consequences, memory attention, decision processes, and social influences. And I'll, I'll describe that in a bit more detail after I just flag the last type of framework um, that I wanted to highlight. And so we first talked about these process models where it's about the step up, steps to take in implementing research into practice at a high level. We've just covered an example of frameworks um, that can be used to identify barriers or enablers or determinants of, of implementation. And finally, there are frameworks that are different from that, which flag specifically different things to evaluate um, in terms of evaluating your implementation initiative. So probably the most well-known and the most well-used amongst these frameworks is the as Russ Glasgow's REAIM framework, which stands for reach, efficacy, slash effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. Um, so if we're thinking about reach here um, with, with, uh, with regards to physician hand hygiene, here this is about the degree to which um, uh, um, the, the target population, in this case physicians, are willing to take part, how, how widely that will be reached. Um, is the intervention effective? Um, Adoption is about to what extent the settings and the people that deliver your ultimate intervention are actually willing to deliver it. Implementation from a re-aim perspective is, did the intervention actually get delivered as designed, so with fidelity? Um, and finally, maintenance um, is about whether at the institution level in which the intervention was delivered and at the people working within the institution, um, was that change institutionalized? Is it maintained over time, not just initially changed? And as I mentioned, we'll focus on that in a bit more detail um, in webinar six when we get to the evaluation. So once we've identified barriers, how do we select strategies? At a high level, again, going back to our principle, there's no magic bullets. We need to select strategies that um, work best for the specific identified barriers and enablers. And just as for the barriers and enablers side, it's helpful to draw on a, a, a frameworks. It can be useful. We think it's useful to be more to, to use frameworks and taxonomies to really explicitly clarify what are the strategies and how do we name them so that we can start to have clarity and replication in, in terms of strategies. Um, and again, we'll cover that in more detail in webinar six. So going back to um, the intervention that was the basis for that hand hygiene um, intervention that uh, or program that um, Kathy and Jeremy and Janet led, um, they ended up developing an intervention. Um, that was delivered slightly differently in, in medicine and surgery wards, focused um, in medicine um, using two slides uh, during resident orientation um, and quick two-minute sessions during stewardship rounds and demonstrating a uh, glow germ product. Um, and similarly in surgery, um, um, just a different way of delivering but similar content. I don't know if Jeremy wants to add a bit more detail to that. Yeah, one of the things is that um, as we were designing our intervention, we were very much constrained by what was likely feasible in a, in a real-world hospital setting. So we could have designed a Rolls-Royce um, uh, intensive sort of education training session, um, but the feedback we got from uh, both key uh, residents and attending uh, physicians uh, um, in the hospital is that basically people wouldn't come because they either didn't have the time or didn't see this as a priority against their, their multiple competing priorities. So one of the things around this, uh, this intervention, which looks very light touch, uh, 
was that it was something that uh, we could actually build into um, the uh, uh, um, into um, uh, uh, the routine uh, um, you know, uh, care and educational processes within uh, uh, within the within the hospital. Um, and so the two slides for the residents during the medicine highlighted the importance of antimicrobial resistance, and this was a, a challenge for the, uh, uh, sorry, of, of hospital-acquired infection. This was a challenge for our hospital that we wanted to address at the highest level uh, and highlighted the, the four moments of hand hygiene. And then during the uh, stewardship rounds, uh, the antibiotic stewardship rounds, when um, Kathy Sue and her colleagues would go and visit um, uh, 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 wards to actually discuss difficult patients, uh, or patients who had different infections, rather, for antibiotic advice, um, they would actually sort of uh, um, build in two minutes of education a week um, for this. And the glow germ, as many people know, is a form of gel that you can sort of basically pretend that you're washing your hands with, and then when you look at your hands under the ultraviolet light, you find out that actually you've completely missed the, uh, 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 the backside of your thumb. Uh, and it's a good way of demonstrating kind of basically that um, and thorough hand cleaning is necessary. So, so, so the, the, the intervention did target the, the barriers we thought were most important, but we also had to make sure that the intervention was something which was um, feasible to conduct and likely acceptable to the clinical groups we're targeting at uh, in the real world setting. And back to Justin. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, and just to highlight that um, medicine's been evaluated locally um, and seems that um, Within medicine and in surgery, there's an improvement um, in those um, in the intervention group. A bit stronger effect in surgery, but nevertheless improvement across the wards. Um, so we're getting towards the end. I uh, just wanted to summarize and sort of flag some initial take-home messages. We all know that patient safety remains a major concern in healthcare systems. We strongly advocate not jumping straight to solutions, um, because developing solutions before understanding the problem risks this problem of uh, developing really elegant, expensive solutions for non-problems. Um, and because we know there are no magic bullets, no strategies work in all instances. Um, we covered that implementation science is a scientific study of um, what determines uh, implementation, the processes, the steps to take for implementation, and how to evaluate outcomes, and looked at a few different frameworks that can hopefully guide us in, in, in that process, rather than going at it alone and making it up as we go. Um, um, and start to make the argument that successful implementation of patient safety change programs requires someone to change what they do, usually more than one person, um, but it requires a behavior change process, and so leveraging what we know from how people change what they do might be helpful um, to optimizing existing programs and possibly um, developing new ones. Um, and hopefully made the argument to you um, to begin with that uh, drawing on implementation science approaches can avoid some of the pitfalls of this uh, of taking a, it seemed like a good idea at the time approach, um, and start to <coughs> promote a, a shared understanding of what works to improve patient safety um, in your settings and, um, and ideally uh, across Canada and worldwide. Um, before I turn it over to, to you to, for, for any questions that you might have, I just want to flag our next webinar uh, that Jeremy's going to lead in about a month's time uh, that's going to focus specifically on knowledge creation and synthesis as it applies to KT and implementation science and patient safety. Um, but in the meantime, um, so we've used this, uh, the, the hand hygiene example for this first webinar, but we're keen to, to integrate um, your own planned or maybe ongoing patient safety initiatives so, uh, in future examples. Um, so if you have any of those and you'd like us to use those examples um, in future webinars, please send um, a short description of them to me uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll work hard to, to integrate those into our subsequent webinars. Um, it just leads me to, to thank you again for your attention and for making the time in your day today. Um, and we're happy to do our best to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Jean, I think we're back to you now. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy and Justin, for that informative presentation. Uh, we, we do have time for a few questions. And um, if people want to send questions as well um, in an email um, at the end, and, I, and you will receive um, a message from Gina Peck, so you will have her email, then we can maybe try and compile a Q&A section for the series. So the first question I have here in the chat box is, is there a comprehensive synthesis of all of the implementation science theories, models, and frameworks? 
Um, so there, it's it's a bit of a moving target because there's a bit of an incentive in the system for people to create their own frameworks to some extent. But um, there is a, I think in 20, I can't remember the exact, uh, it's led by Michelle Bensing. Um, there's a review of um, existing frameworks uh, published in Implementation Science, um, which I can perhaps send to you, Gina, if, um, for circulation. Um, but uh, it is a bit of a moving target. Um, um, also, because because it's an interdisciplinary um, field, to some extent, we're still integrating perspectives from other disciplines as they come on board um, in, in informing this. Um, and so, um, but 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 um, I'll send through what we know so far in terms of a, a high-level synthesis. Perfect. Thank you. And then we can distribute that. Uh, the next question. How do we know what KT framework will work for us? Our organization was overwhelmed with the evidence and options and couldn't decide what framework was best for us. You reference choosing a framework by understanding what you want to use it for. Are there documents or tools to help with that selection process? Um, so it's, it's Jeremy. I mean, I, I... My sense would be that if you chose, um, you know, basically a, a stepwise process model to start off with, that's probably going to be the most useful starting point because that just sort of basically will guide you uh, through a process which, if you pay attention to the steps, um, like the French model, which I think sort of gives more detail than perhaps the, the knowledge to action model, that that will be kind of quite useful. But what you'll find that as you're sort of starting to think about, well, who needs to do what differently, or uh, um, how do we identify the buyers and facilitators, you may then want to um, uh, 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 bring in other types of models which are more understanding models. And throughout the webinar series, you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to get examples of sort of certainly how Justin and I, as we're doing our work and working with colleagues in healthcare settings, are trying to operationalize these approaches. So as Justin said at the start, that this is really a taster, um, and the, you know, I, um, this is a question that would be great to come back to, you know, particularly after maybe um, uh, uh, the webinar three and four. So hopefully you'll stick with us, and, and uh, um, um, as we talk more about these and give you a bit more information on the models that we're proposing or use, um, you'll find that that helps uh, answer this question. Thank you. Next question, could, the, could you comment more on um, guidelines and pathways alone do not equal safe health care? Um, yes, I, so it's Jeremy. Um, I, I've spent uh, a fair amount of my career looking at the effects of, of different, of, of producing and uh, uh, disseminating guidelines. Uh, and what we know is that if you sort of basically, um, but often, uh, as I said at the starting point, there's a gap of 30 to 35 percent between what we know we should be doing and what we actually achieve. Uh, and uh, if you um, if you uh, uh, basically de uh, disseminate and uh, or develop and disseminate evidence-based guidelines, at best you're probably going to get an improvement of two or three percent within that. So the production of guidelines is uh, 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 not by itself going to optimize care. That. To me, however, what I would say is I see that uh, the development of guidelines is being necessary but not sufficient to lead to safer and better quality of care. If we don't have guidelines, then we're kind of hoping that the clinicians we're working with as a whole will kind of have a sense about what might be good practice. The guidelines allow us to sort of focus on what the evidence says is good practice. So I see these the guidelines as being a very important aspect of the knowledge infrastructure that healthcare systems need. But we need to do more than just sort of create them and maybe send them out to clinicians. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, don't you see a red flag that the goal of implementation science is both empirical and theoretical? Um, so it's Jeremy again. There's a good question. Justin is, is, is thinking, or looks like he's thinking very hard. <laughs> I, 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 I agree entirely with that. I think uh, you know, basically a good theory is something that is a distillation of a body of knowledge and experience. Uh, and so as we are doing sort of basically empirical research, um, you know, maybe developing and testing interventions, we are doing that so we can contribute to theory. 
And then we also want to use the theory when we're thinking about what do we test next. So I, I would see that uh, the, the link between doing sort of you know, empirical research and you know, theory development is, is highly linked and highly complementary. We need kind of, you know, we basically need to do both. If we just do endless experiments and then don't actually develop, you know, and refine our theories based on them, then we're not maximizing the knowledge we're gaining from those experiments. Likewise, if we just develop theories and then never test them in the real world setting, uh, we're not doing uh, uh, the field any good. So we have to bring these things uh, or do these things together. So I, I completely agree with, I think, the, the kind of the, the comment. Yeah, the only thing to add to that is that the um, that highlights that 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 link between um, empirical uh, and theory highlights the that theories themselves are not not perfect and in, in a sense because they're representative of what we currently know they are meant to be um, from a Popperian perspective falsified um, and replaced by a better theory as we keep going um, and uh, rather than seeing them as sort of these. Um, unmovable objects that, that should be applied um, dogmatically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. With regards to your case, did your focus groups and interviews show the main problem to be knowledge deficit versus other problems, for example, lack of washing facilities? So, so no, I think the focus group and the, the interviews demonstrated that there are many different things that contributed to this. And this is Typically, what we find, we very rarely find there's a single, you know, kind of uh, neat barrier that if we'd only overcome that, then, you know, basically practice would be perfect. So what we, what it allowed us to do is identify a wide range of potential um, barriers, and then with our, you know, our local expert group in the hospital and our, and, and the people who've got experience in behavior change, we try, we try to think about which were the most important barriers that we should prioritize, and then what interventions might address those. So um, it, it, it's, I mean, what you typically find when you do these processes is that um, there's not one problem, there's many different problems, and then the job of the, the people trying to do, you know, change, whether it's improving safety or quality, is to sort of, you know, basically make sense of what the barriers are, which are the ones that are most important, which are the ones are so critical that we need to address them, and then build our interventions around that. Okay. I see we are at time for closing the call. Uh, we want to respectfully thank Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Presto for sharing their time and expertise today. And thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend. We know how busy your day is and appreciate you choosing to spend time with CPSI. Please visit our website for a taped version of the presentation today and also to sign up for the next webinar in March. If you want to continue this conversation or you had a question that wasn't addressed, please feel free to send us an email. So you should all receive Gina Peck's uh, email following um, with a thank you email in your inbox shortly, and you can respond to that. Have a, have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.